Hello again, Econ 160, and welcome to another video lecture. Today, we are going to be talking about public goods and common resources. Here's our motivation for today. So far in this class, we've extolled the virtues of competitive free markets. We learned that competitive free markets are efficient ways to allocate resources because goods get produced by the lowest cost producers and they get allocated to the highest benefit consumers. And the price mechanism was the invisible hand, which directs market participants to act efficiently, uh, even though they're all only seeking their own benefit. We also learned that government intervention into competitive markets, such as price controls or taxation, leads to market distortions and deadweight loss. So what's the role of governments in free market economies then? Because if you ask any economist, no economist would advocate for completely dissolving the government and eliminating all taxes, even though we say that taxes lead to deadweight loss. So there must be something about the government that people find valuable that somehow free markets can't provide. And in fact, if you look at the data, you would see that government actually accounts for between 30 to 50 percent of the total economic output in most advanced market economies, including the United States. And so these are the questions that we're going to explore in today's lecture. Uh, we're going to ask, are there some goods for which free markets uh, would fail to provide efficiently? And then we'll ask, what is the role of government when there are these market failures? And the gentleman you see here is Paul Samuelson. He was an American economist, and he wrote a paper titled The Pure Theory of Public Expenditures, which shapes the way that economists think about public goods today. And here are our learning outcomes for today's lecture. By mastering this lesson, you should be able to define the meaning of rivalry and excludability, and identify examples of rival, non-rival, excludable, and non-excludable goods and services. You should be able to define the meaning of public goods, common resources, private goods, and club goods, and you should be able to identify examples from real life of each. You should be able to explain what the free rider problem is and why public goods are underprovided in free markets. You should be able to explain the tragedy of the commons and why common resources get overused in free markets. And finally, you should be able to discuss examples of government involvement in the provision of public goods and in the management of common resources. Now, before we get started, I want to read you a passage from the Encyclopedia Britannica's entry on government, which talks about the history of ancient human government. So here goes. So long as humans were few, there was hardly any government. The division of function between ruler and ruled occurred only, if at all, within the family. The largest social groups, whether tribes or villages, were little more than loose associations of families. The rise of agriculture began to change that state of affairs. In the land of Sumer, the invention of irrigation necessitated grander arrangements. Control of the flow of water down the Tigris and the Euphrates had to be coordinated by a central authority so that fields could be watered downstream as well as further up. It became necessary to devise a calendar so as to know when the spring floods might be expected. As those skills evolved, society evolved with them. The village council gradually undertook a division of labor so that some specialized as priests, others as warriors, farmers, or tax gatherers, who are key figures in every civilized society. Unfortunately, but given human nature inevitably, the young cities of Sumer quarreled over the distribution of the river's waters, and their wealth excited the greed of nomads outside. War, perhaps the most potent of all forces of historical change, announced its arrival, and military leadership became at least as important an element of kingship as divine sanction. It was to remain so throughout history. Whenever kings have neglected their military duties, they have also endangered their thrones. So from this passage, we can see some of the main functions of the earliest human governments. Uh, 
the coordination of natural resources, the provision of military protection, and the collection of taxes in order to fund those two activities. But the question is, why was a central authority needed for these things at all? Why didn't the price mechanism work to allocate the river's waters efficiently? And why was a king necessary for military leadership? Why couldn't these early societies simply have purchased military services from a free market? To begin to understand the role of government in society, we need to start by thinking about how some goods are different from others. And we're going to focus on two key differentiating characteristics, rivalry and excludability. All right, let's start with rivalry. A good is said to be rival if consumption by one person necessarily reduces consumption by another person. All right, so a hamburger is an example of a rival good because if Jack consumes a hamburger, then Jill cannot also consume the same hamburger. So Jack's consumption reduces Jill's consumption, and the hamburger is rival. A good is said to be non-rival if consumption by one person does not reduce the consumption of any other person. So national defense is an example of a non-rival good. So when the military protects our country from invasion, it does so for everyone, right? And so Jack's enjoyment of military protection does not reduce the amount by which Jill is also protected, and so national defense is non-rival. And now let's talk about excludability. A good is said to be excludable if a person can be prevented from consuming the good after it's been produced. And so a hamburger is an example of an excludable good. Right, because if you grill a hamburger, you can decide who gets it and who doesn't get it using whatever criteria you prefer. Uh, so hamburgers are excludable. A good is said to be non-excludable if no one can be prevented from consuming the good once it has been produced. And so national defense is an example of a non-excludable good. When the military protects our country from invasion, it does so for everyone in the country. The military can't protect Jack without also protecting Jill, and so, right, Jill cannot be excluded, and so national defense is non-excludable. Goods and services can be classified into four different types based on their degree of rivalry and excludability. And here's a table showing the different classifications. So if a good is rival and excludable, then we call that a private good, okay? And so it's easy for private goods to be traded in markets, right? Because uh, of their excludability, producers can make sure that only consumers willing to pay for the good are able to get it. And because of rivalry, only consumers who are willing to actually pay are going to be able to enjoy it, right? And so here are some examples of private goods. We already talked about hamburgers. Uh, but computers are a private good because they're excludable and rival. Auto insurance is a private good because it's excludable and rival. And one thing that we learned uh, from our previous analysis of markets is that competitive markets work pretty well to allocate private goods efficiently. Um, in fact, in all of the analysis that we did up to this point, we have assumed that the market was a market for a private good. If a good is non-rival and non-excludable, then we call that good a public good, okay? And it's difficult for public goods to be traded in markets. Uh, because public goods are non-excludable, uh, producers are going to find it difficult to stop consumers who are unwilling to pay for the good from getting it. And because it's non-rival, uh, many consumers are actually going to be unwilling to pay because they can enjoy it for free as long as someone else pays for it. And so here are some examples of public goods. Uh, we already talked about national defense, um, but crime prevention is also similar to national defense. Uh, it's non-excludable because, uh, well, first of all, no one can predict exactly who's going to be the victim of a crime. And so when crime is reduced, everyone in the community benefits from the reduced risk. It's also non-rival because uh, one person's enjoyment of a reduced risk of crime 
doesn't diminish anyone else's enjoyment of a reduced risk of crime. All right, a tornado siren is another example of a public good um, because it's also non-rival and non-excludable. It's non-rival because one person hearing the tornado siren uh, and being warned about a tornado doesn't prevent anyone else from hearing it and being warned. And it's non-excludable because once the tornado siren has been provided, it's hard to exclude anyone in the community from hearing it when it goes off. Okay, and if a good is non-rival uh, but excludable, then we call that good a club good. All right, club goods are easily traded in markets because producers can, uh, because of the excludability, stop consumers who aren't willing to pay from uh, enjoying the good. Uh, but club goods do behave somewhat differently from private goods uh, because once a club good is produced, then many people can enjoy it at the same time with no additional cost. And we'll discuss uh, this feature of club goods later when we talk about monopolies. Uh, here are some examples of club goods. A private beach is an example of a club good, right? It's excludable because if the beach is small enough, then the owner can easily prevent people from accessing it, uh, maybe by closing off entry points or by hiring a patrol, right? So it's excludable. Um, but multiple people can enjoy the beach simultaneously without diminishing each other's enjoyment. And so to an extent, it's also non-rival. Other club goods include cable TV and video streaming services like Netflix. Um, they're excludable because uh, the cable TV company or the streaming company can easily stop people from accessing their services and locking the content behind a paid subscription. Um, but many people can enjoy these products simultaneously without diminishing each other's enjoyment, and so they're non-rival. And finally, if we have a good that is rival, but non-excludable, uh, then we call that good a common resource. Common resources are usually natural resources that exist rather than being produced. And common resources may or may not be traded in markets, uh, but if they are traded in markets, then the markets for common resources tend not to function efficiently for reasons that we'll discuss later on. Here are some examples of common resources. Uh, fish in the ocean are an example of a common resource. The fish are rival because when one person catches a fish, then that's one less fish for anyone else to consume. Uh, but they're non-excludable in the sense that because the ocean's large area uh, makes it very difficult to patrol and enforce limits on fishing, you can't really stop anyone from taking fish out of the ocean. Uh, using a similar logic, we can say that timber in a large forest is like a common resource. It's rival because if one person cuts down a tree, then that's one less tree for anyone else to cut down. Um, but it's non-excludable because the forest's large geographic area makes patrolling and enforcing any limits on uh, logging uh, very difficult. Now, one important common resource that you can indeed think about as a common resource is the environment. So clean air and clean water, for example, are resources for humans to use, but some types of use can diminish the ability of others to use it. Uh, for example, when a factory pollutes into a river, that's going to diminish the ability of people downstream to use the water for drinking. And so the use of the river is rivalrous between the factory and the people downstream. Uh, it's not excludable, however, right, if no one can claim any rights over the water in the river. And so unless the government does something, either by defining uh, who has rights over the water in the river or by regulating the factory, then it would be difficult for the people downstream to do anything to stop the factory from polluting. All right, so we just defined four different types of goods in terms of their rivalry and excludability. But it's important to keep in mind that uh, there's no real hard and fast rules for what should be called a private good, public good, club good, or common resource, um, right? For example, there's no committee of economists who declare that private beaches should always be called club goods or that tornado sirens should always be called public goods. Uh, 
Uh, these definitions are matters of degrees, and which classification fits best often just depends on the circumstances. And so to help us think through these issues, um, here are a few of the ways in which the degree of rivalry and the degree of excludability can change for the same kind of good. Okay, first is geographic extent. Geographic extent can change the degree of rivalry and excludability for a good. Uh, so for our example, we said that tornado sirens are a public good. And that's indeed true. A tornado siren is indeed non-rival and non-excludable, but only for the community which is within its hearing range. right? But when we think about multiple communities that might span a large geographic area, then we can see that the non-rivalry and the non-excludability starts to break down. Because across different communities, the tornado siren actually becomes rivalrous and excludable. It's rival because one community purchasing a tornado siren means that uh, a different community can't use the same tornado siren. And it's excludable because anyone who's not within hearing range of the siren doesn't get to benefit from it. And so we might be able to say that tornado siren is a public good in the context of a single community, but a private good in the context of multiple communities. Okay, next is level of use. Uh, so for this one, consider a road. Anyone can use the road, so it's non-excludable. But whether the road is rival or non-rival depends on the number of cars that are using it. When there are only a few cars, then there isn't any traffic, and so each car gets to enjoy the road without diminishing anyone else's speed, and so the road is non-rival, and it's like a public good. But now when there are lots of cars, and there's a traffic jam, then each car is adding to the traffic and diminishing every other car's speed. And so in that case, the road becomes rival, and then it's more like a common resource. So the third thing to think about is technology. All right, technology can affect the rivalry and the excludability of a good. And so we're going to use music for our example. Um, in olden times, when music had to be performed live, Music was more like a private good because only a limited number of people could listen to a performer at a time, and the musician could easily exclude who he or she would be willing to play for. But with the advent of radio, music became more like a club good. Music was still excludable because the owners of records could stop radio stations from playing songs unless they paid a licensing fee. But music became more non-rival because anyone could now listen to a radio broadcast without really diminishing anyone else's enjoyment. All right, but then when uh, the internet and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing came along, music started to become a little bit more like a public good because uh, the excludability was quickly diminishing into non-excludability. Right, anyone with an MP3 file could easily send the music to anyone else anywhere in the world at nearly zero cost. But as the music industry got better at preventing this form of digital piracy, music went back to being more like a club good. And so today, music is primarily provided over streaming services like Spotify or iTunes that have club goods-like characteristics. And finally, there is the law. All right, Laws can affect the rivalry and excludability of a good. So think about scientific research. Scientific research is basically the production of knowledge. And knowledge is by itself both non-rival and non-excludable. Right? My knowing of a fact or theory doesn't prevent anyone else from knowing it. So knowledge is non-rival. And because information is easily shared and transmitted, it's actually quite costly to stop someone from learning a scientific fact or theory once it's been discovered. So it's close to being non-excludable. And because of that, basic scientific research can be thought of as a public good. There are certain kinds of applied research, however, that can be patented. And so what a patent is, is that when you get a patent on an idea or an invention, then no one else is allowed to use that invention unless you allow them to. Uh, so the law makes patented research excludable and therefore more like a club good than a public good, at least until the patent expires. So basic scientific research, basic facts and theories, 
like E equals MC squared. Those are not patentable, and so they're more like public goods. Whereas certain kinds of applied research, like pharmaceuticals, uh, those are patentable, and so they're going to be more like club goods because of the law. So now let's look back at some of the public goods that we've identified so far. There was national defense, crime prevention, tornado sirens, and basic research. And what's one of the common threads between these goods? They're all provided by and funded by the government, right? Um, in comparison, the private goods we identified, hamburgers, computers, auto insurance, none of these are primarily provided by the government. They're all mainly provided in private markets. And so the question is, why are governments the main providers of public goods? Why don't we see public goods being traded in private markets? And the answer to this is that public goods suffer from something known as the free rider problem. A free rider is someone who enjoys the benefit of a public good, but without contributing to its provision. All right. And so a lot of students can best understand the free rider problem by thinking about a group project, right? A group project where everyone gets the same grade is just like a public good. The final grade is both non-rival and non-excludable because everyone on the team gets the same score regardless of how much they contributed. And when that happens, lazy members of the team are gonna to wanna to free ride off the efforts of others by contributing as little as possible while still receiving the benefits of a good grade. And because of these free riders, group projects are usually not as good as they could have been if everyone contributed fully. And so in that sense, we can say that the free rider problem led to an under provision of quality in group projects. And by the same logic, more generally speaking, the free rider problem is going to lead to under provision of public goods in the free market. So does that really happen? Well, let's think about one of the public goods we talked about, basic research. Currently, a significant portion of basic research in America is funded by government grants. Do we think that private investment and private donors could support the same level of research? It's actually pretty difficult to see how, right? Because unlike applied research, basic research often doesn't have any immediate commercial applications, uh, so investors wouldn't be interested. And as for private donors, sure, there will be some wealthy donors who may fund some projects, uh, but most people, I think, would not be willing to contribute their hard-earned income to basic research, right? They would think to themselves, uh, even if I don't contribute, uh, I'll still eventually benefit from the effects of the research, and besides, the amount that I have to contribute is so little that it probably won't make much of a difference anyway. And maybe you think that kind of thinking is selfish, but if enough people think this way, then the amount of funding available for research will be significantly less than what is being provided right now by the government. And so the free rider problem, again, says that public goods will be underprovided in free markets. And because of that, we often see governments directly involved in the provision of public goods. So here are some of the ways in which the government provides public goods in the U.S. Uh, first, we already talked about national defense. Um, the U.S. federal government is the sole provider of national defense in our country. National defense spending is about $700 billion a year and accounts for 15% of federal expenditures and about 3.2% of GDP. Um, although private contractors can be involved in the provision of national defense, we still say that it's primarily provided by the government uh, because the source of funds is still coming from the government and from taxes. All right, crime prevention. Um, crime prevention in the US is also provided by the government, um, but this time state and local governments instead of the federal government. Uh, and state and local governments in total spend about $200 billion a year on law enforcement and corrections. Basic scientific research. I mentioned that a lot of scientific research is funded through grants. Uh, and state and local governments also fund scientific research simply by paying the salaries of the university, uh, university faculty that conduct that research as part of their duties.
And finally, one thing that I want to talk about is helping the poor. In the U.S., as with many other countries, governments actually take the lead in trying to help the poor through social programs like food stamps. Um, but an interesting question to ask is, why does the government have to get involved in helping the poor at all? Why can't private charities do the job? And one argument for that is because helping the poor is a little bit like a public good, in the sense that once a poor person has been helped, then everyone can enjoy that fact equally, whether or not they personally contributed, right? And so helping the poor is non-rival and non-excludable in that sense. And because of that, some people are going to free ride off the generosity of others. They might think to themselves, well, I am not in a position to help right now. Let someone else who has more money do it. Um, but of course, there's always someone with more money, right? And so because of free riders, private charities would not be able to raise as much money for helping the poor as the government would be able to through the force of taxation. So in the Encyclopedia Britannica article, we saw that two of the functions of early governments were military leadership and the coordination of natural resources. And we understand now why governments have to be the ones to provide military leadership, because military protection is a public good. But then what's up with the coordination of natural resources? Why are governments involved in doing that? And the answer is that common resources will tend to be overused in an inefficient way by free markets. And so let's think about why that is. So let's consider our example of river water again as a common resource. Use of the river water is not excludable because the river is long and no one has well-defined rights over the river. And because of this, a factory upstream is free to pollute the river to the detriment to everyone downstream. And so unless government gets involved, either by regulating the factory or by defining the water rights more explicitly, there's not much people downstream can do to stop the factory upstream from polluting, right? And so we have an inefficient use of the river's resources, okay? Um, you can also consider another example of fish in the ocean. Because the ocean is not excludable, it's too large to patrol, Fishermen will catch too many fish, which leads to depopulation of the fish stock. The depopulation could have been avoided if all of the fishermen limited their catch, but none of them have any incentive to do so, right? Because they would think to themselves like this. If I limit my catch and the others don't, then I make less money and the fish are depopulated anyway. If I don't limit my catch and others do, then I get to make more money and the fish won't be depopulated. And since it depends really more on what other people do than on what I do, I might as well just catch as many fish as I can. Uh, maybe not all fishermen would think this way, but if enough of them do, then they're still gonna be overfishing and the fish are still gonna become depopulated. And so to stop this, the fishermen either have to organize themselves to somehow enforce limits on fishing or else the government may have to step in and get involved. And so these two examples show that when people act to maximize their own benefits, then common resources will tend to become overused unless there's some form of regulation. And the overuse of common resources is known as the tragedy of the commons. Historically, there have been two main policy responses to the tragedy of the commons. The first is privatization or the establishment of property rights. And this approach recognizes that the main problem with common resources is their non-excludability. Uh, if somehow the common resource could be made excludable, then the good would behave more like a private good and the overutilization would end and the markets would function more efficiently. Right? For example, uh, overfishing only occurs because no fisherman can stop any other fisherman from using the water. If the right to use the water could be exclusively given to one fishing company, and if that right can be enforced, uh, then the fishing company would have a private incentive to maintain the fish population and stop it from depopulating. Uh, 
And in our river example, if the right to clean water was granted to the people living along the river, then the polluting factory would either have to stop polluting or somehow compensate the people downstream for the damages that it causes. An illustration of this comes from a study of oyster beds in the Atlantic coast. Uh, because oysters attach themselves to underwater rock, it's possible to define property rights over oyster beds based on their fixed geographic areas. But the thing is, not all states do this. In some states, the oyster beds are treated as common property for all oyster harvesters. In other states, however, uh, the oyster beds are treated as private property that can be leased from the state so that the leaser uh, has the exclusive right to harvest from those oyster beds. And researchers have found that in the states with the well-defined property rights, the oyster harvesters were more efficient and oysters suffered from less depletion. Uh, so there's an illustration of how defining property rights and privatizing common resources uh, can lead to more efficient utilization in real life. Privatization isn't always practical, however, uh, especially if property rights are costly or difficult to enforce, and that depends on the context. Right, so in our oyster example, they could define and enforce property rights because the oysters would attach themselves to rocks which are in a fixed location, and so it would be easy to enforce a definition based on a fixed location. Um, but if you consider something like fish in the open ocean, that's much more difficult to define, right? Because first of all, the fish are mobile, and so you can't really define property rights over the fish themselves. And second, the ocean is such a huge area to patrol that it would be very difficult to enforce any kind of property rights over the ocean. And so when property rights are difficult to enforce, then regulation may be a better or even the only response to the tragedy of the commons. And regulation can come in various forms, like restrictions on the quantity of fish that can be legally caught, or maybe in the pollution example, requirements to use certain types of pollution reducing technologies in your factory. Uh, and in practice, in the United States, there's a complicated patchwork of different environmental and natural resource regulations administered by a variety of agencies like the EPA and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, fuel economy standards for cars and smog checks, those are examples of regulations which are meant to protect the common resource of clean air. We started the chapter with a story about the earliest human governments, and we saw that the earliest governments were formed to help coordinate natural resources and to provide military protection. And so in this lecture, we learned why that is. Government was required for military protection because the military is a public good, which free markets will fail to provide efficiently due to the free rider problem. And government was required for coordinating natural resources because in a free market, they would have been overutilized due to the tragedy of the commons. And so it's important for us to understand the economics of public goods and common resources because it lets us understand the role of governments in market economies. Understanding which goods are private, public, or common resources can help us determine when government involvement is likely to be productive or counterproductive. Right? In a competitive market for private goods, government involvement is likely to be counterproductive because the market is already efficient. But if we're talking about a public good, then government might be necessary for the efficient provision of it. And if we're talking about common resources, then government involvement may be necessary to avoid overutilization and subsequent depletion. So I hope in this lecture uh, helped you appreciate the role of government in our society, and I hope that it influences how you think, talk, and debate about public policy in the future. Okay, that's it for today's lecture. Thank you for sticking around to the end. Here's a quick review. We define that a good is rival if consumption by one person uh, necessarily reduces consumption by another. A good is excludable if a person can be prevented from consuming the good after it has been produced. 
Goods that are both rival and excludable are called private goods. Goods that are non-rival and non-excludable are called public goods. Goods that are non-rival and excludable are called club goods. And goods that are rival and non-excludable are called common resources. We saw from previous lectures that competitive free markets allocate private goods efficiently, but not so for public goods. Public goods will tend to be underprovided by free markets due to the free rider problem, and therefore governments are often the main provider of public goods. We saw that common resources will tend to be overused in free markets due to the tragedy of the commons, and that government can help promote efficient utilization of common resources, either through privatization and the establishment of property rights or by regulation. Okay, so thank you again for sticking around to the end of the lecture, and next time we're going to talk about something called externalities, which is another reason for governments to get involved in markets. See you next time.